I don't do this. I may never do this again, but I'm going to go completely off, off script today. I, uh, wait, wait and see. Wait and see, you guys. This year for me has been one of those years that there was before this year and after this year. My life is cleaved in two. And I don't mean just that a plan didn't work out. I mean that every single, some of you know who I am, have read books, have taken things like Strength Finder or Standout. You know that I spent my entire life focused on using reliable data to pinpoint the truth about a human. And, and this year, every single part of that mission, every single part of that identity, every single part of that purpose has been challenged. On March 12th of this year, I got a call from him. It was 6.35 in the morning. It was a beautiful spring day that Jasmine was just blooming. And, and um, I, I'm, I pick up the phone. I don't live in, I live 15 minutes away, but he called up and said, Dad, Dad, his voice was flat. He said, Dad, um, can you come around? I'm like, I'm just going to work. He goes, uh, uh, can you come around? I'm like, why? He goes, because um, mom's just been arrested by the FBI. And I've never shared that. I mean, everyone, I've been, ugh. Everyone and their mother has been calling me the last six months, the Wall Street Journal and Good Morning America and the Today Show, everybody. I've never shared this, so I don't even know where this is going to go. <laughs> but, so we, and, and I, I think the smell of jasmine is forever ruined for me. Because <laughs> I'm shocked, like I'm, Jack's mom is, is not a bad person. Like, she, she's Captain Marvel, gets things done. Like, she's, she's the anti-flake. So it didn't compute, and I got in the car, and it felt like it was three hours to get there, and also no time at all. And I get in the house, and they're both sitting there, Lilia and Jack, and they're on the floor, this wooden floor. And it felt like they would, it felt like someone was moving, it was a weird feeling, like someone's moving house. Like if I were to open the doors, you'd find uh, the, the things in boxes and, and, and movers about, so it just felt empty. And you spend the first hour sort of cons uh, consoling, like the, uh, nine FBI agents came in, our guns drawn, and took their mum away. <sighs> And, and then Jack's on Twitter, and he's finding out that this is actually part of a raid, that there's a lot of people that have been taken away. And, and then he gets the government complaint on how he finds the government complaint. I still haven't found it, you know, six months later, but he, like, he's half an hour in, he finds it. And, and I forgot my glasses, and I'm, I can't read it, so we're both, Lily and I, sort of hanging around his back, looking at what, and, uh, and he, he says, well, uh, she's not mentioned until page 15. Uh, so something about honest services fraud. Maybe, maybe she's a witness. Um, and then both of them gasp, and, and he goes, um, and he says one line, he just says, um, Mom paid Rick Singer $50,000 to cheat on my ACT, and she's planning to do the same for Lilia. And if you've ever seen someone crumple from the inside, every aspect of that sentence hit him all at once as he realized that his achievements and he called me three or four months before that and was so proud of what he'd done. It was not his own. The person who he loved most in the world had uh, committed to a life of lying to him. And he crumpled from the inside. And I hugged him, again, bigger, so harder, but I hugged him. And he just said in my ear, what's going to happen now, Dad? And I didn't have anything. Like, what's, talk about being deep in the forest. You're like, somewhat, like when I get hurt, I bounce back. If I'm the warrior, someone cuts me, okay, I'll work. When someone hurts your kids, you're split open, right? You're just split open. And if it's their mother, it's, it just doesn't compute. And, and so I spent the last six months, and I, I got to tell you, I, I, as Rachel was saying, there's days you wake up and you're just, you're just bawling. You wake up crying. You look in the mirror and you're like, <laughs> and you start thinking about the ecosystem of the school system, and there's too much money, and then the stupid, I know about tests. Those ACTs and SATs measure nothing about the uniqueness of the child. I know that. Like, what should I say about that? The stupid irony here, my entire career is focused on using reliable data to reveal the truth about a person. This is a scandal where fake data hides the truth about a person. It's just, it would be funny if it wasn't so awful. And of course, parents, like, we're in there too. We have, they, I, I woke up one day and I had this image, this sort of horrible nightmare dream of everyone grabbing the joystick of Pac-Man. 
All these parents grabbing the joystick of Pac-Man and you're just moving your child. You see the fruit and you go for it. And then they, they, they get to be an honor student and you get the bumper sticker and you put it on the car. And then they get to go from the A club soccer team to the B and you just let it slip at the cocktail party that they just moved to the A. To, oh, yours is still in the B. Oh, well. And then we just keep moving. And then there's the ghost behind, but we jerk and yank and jerk and yank and we get to the next level. Yay. It's like, it's like parenting is a competitive sport where there's scores and there's, the finish line is the college acceptance. And of course, you look at that and you go, parenting is not a competitive sport. There's no scores. There's no finish line. There's no winners. There's only losers, most of them children. And you, you go, what are we doing? John talks about transforming countries through values. It's like, what are we? If someone were to come into my house and say, oh, you know what we could do? Just cheat for your son. Every single one of us, I think, in this room would go, get the hell out of my room. Get out of my house. And that, that didn't happen here. And you go, what? And it's, you, get, you get stopped. My entire life has been based on seeing, again, to, sorry to keep pointing to Rachel, but she was, I'm so right, seeing the truth of a human, the best of a human, strength finder, not deficiency weakness finder. It's like, come on. So it's, you get thrown, man. You get so, so thrown. And when you're in that depth, I think finally, and the reason why I'm sharing this now is, I finally figured out, I, couldn't, I had nothing to say. I couldn't figure out what to say. I just kept looking at the ecosystem that was broken and some of the parenting strategies that many of us do actually do that, 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 that are broken. And you just, you sort of marinate in brokenness. And if you end up there, you, you're, no matter how much problem solving you do, you, you live in that darkness. And so I stopped. I, I, I did what some of you would do. You sort of find the, the, at the end of a thread in your life that it feels true and you, and you pull it, see where it leads. And I... I put my free thinking research hat back on. And I was like, I've got to look at one. Where's, that, where's any light? Where's any point of light? Where's anything that works? What do I have that's anything that works? And for me, maybe it would have been the same for you, some of you. It was my mom and dad, Graham and Joe. They're not perfect as parents, but I went back to that and went, what did they do for me and my brother and sister? My dad, uh, first one in our family to go to college, rational, super rational guy. My mom, um, didn't go to college. Dad was a coal miner. Dad before that was a coal miner. Mom is a person of faith and spirituality. She's right now 80 going on 60 and heals to this day in the name of Jesus Christ. Like that's my mom. <laughs> she does, right? So they're different, but they did share one thing. Uh, maybe two things. One is they believed in the uniqueness of the child. Again, as Rachel was saying, you've got four kids, you don't know. You have four unique individuals. Where did they come from? Your children are not your children. God sort of gave them to you and you just try and see them the best that you can. My parents certainly, Graham and Joe certainly believed that. Three really different kids treated really differently. And, and the second thing they believed in was space making. Space making. They were super intelligent space makers. You leave a space and you let the child bounce around inside it. The walls of the space are made of love. So you've got things to, but you make the space, you leave the space, you're an intelligent space maker. And that might sound theoretical to you, but for me, it had massive value as a child. Because I grew up between the ages of zero and 13, I couldn't speak. which is weird given what I'm doing now, but I couldn't speak. I had a stutter, a terrible stutter. Not a sweet little one, but one of those ones where you start talking, the person, the, the, you can see their expression go from oh to oh to, and it, it ends up like it's the, the fish called Wonder scene where John Cleese is like, just spit it out. Like that was my life for my first 13 years. And, and as a parent, a stammer is a really difficult thing because not only that you cannot do anything about it, but the more you try, the worse it gets. The more you intervene, they took me to one speech pathologist one time where the guy was like, Peter Piper, Peter Piper, say that. I thought, the more he pushed, the worse I got. My just mouth just shut down. And so they went, you know what? I'm just, you're either going to figure out how to live happily within your stammering world or you'll find a way through it. But we are not going to tell you how to, we're going to create love and space. And, and it was hard, right? It's like, no, it's not life-threatening. It's not like I had some disease, but it's, as a boy, I don't know, it's hard. Particularly if you have a name like Marcus Buckingham. <laughs> Try and say that name with a stammer. It's like you end up hooked and thrashing on the length of the long line of your name like a dead fish. My first day at school at six, I go and the elder boy goes, hi, what's your name? I'm like, I try and say the word Marcus. I can't get it out at all. It's just one long M. So I shut up. He, go, he looks at me weird. We go into the teacher. The teacher goes, what is your name? And the elder boy, I still remember this, goes, uh, he couldn't say. And the teacher goes, he didn't say? And he goes, no, I couldn't say. And uh, so he goes, 
what's your name? And I go, I tried Buckingham. I'm like, Marcus is a design. Bucking. And I, it just was ba 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 right? And for the rest of my time there, that was my nickname. It was done that day, which again, isn't a disaster. It's just, a, oh, yeah. and, I, I, and I was okay. Mom loved me, dad loved me, it was all good. And then one day, 13 years old, and I, I've got three more minutes here, John, is that okay? Um, I think three minutes, or 40, I don't know. Um, <laughs> anyway, right before you graduated at 13, they picked five boys, I went to an all boys school, five boys to, to read aloud in chapel. And I never worried about it that much because I'm like, no one's going to pick me. I can't read aloud in class, let alone reading aloud in chapel. And then I see it, I remember it was a Tuesday, I see it in red ink, my name for reading next week. And I'm like, I mean, fear. Ugh. And, and the, the day before I was supposed to speak, Mr. Pratt, his name was the headmaster, he took me into chapel, and a five-minute reading turned into 20 minutes of just suffering for both of us. I go home, I don't really complain about the suffering to mom and dad, but I tell them, uh, really bad news, guys, uh, I'm supposed to read it out in chapel tomorrow, and I'm waiting for mom and dad to do what many moms and dads would do, to pick up the phone and go, Mr. Pratt, you will not be humiliating my child in that way. My child's self-esteem is paramount. It's what everything's all about, and you will not have him stand up. Like I was waiting for them to do the thing, the thing, the thing the parents do. You reach in and you fix stuff for your child. Um, and, and all my mom said, <laughs> straight back, good posture, she said, that'll be lovely, Poppet. And I'm like, there's no part of that that's like, it'll be lovely, Poppet. And you're like, so the next morning I get up, I'm petrified, I mean, I, I can't, you know, Seems weird because I'm doing this, right? So you go, well, really? I'm pe- I can't speak. And you're, I'm going to stand up in front of all my friends and they're reading along. It, it wasn't actually a piece from the Bible. It was a commentary on a piece in Corinthians, but they all had it. Like they could see every word. Like, can you imagine? I, anyway, I get up. I, uh, I walk around to the lectern. I stand at the lectern and I look up and I can't even begin to find the words to tell you quite what happened. Like a feeling came over my head, like it was around my head, my, my throat opened up and I did the entire, it's like I saw 400 pairs of eyes and the words came perfectly. Not a single stammer, right? I mean, yeah, I didn't do anything. It just happened. And I don't know what happened. My dad says it's your synapses. My mom thinks it's the Holy Spirit. I don't, maybe it's a combination, <laughs> right? I don't know. I do know only these two things. I know from that point on, I tricked the world. I decided when I was going to talk to one person, I would talk, pretend in my own little head that I was talking to 400. I would pretend, I took a strength, if you will, a thing that strengthened me, and then I, I, I used it to overcome a weakness. For some stupid, crazy reason, talking to 400 people gives me fluency. Talking to one, I have disfluency. 400, I, so I, and from that moment on, the stammer went away. I took, it took a week. So it went away so much that people in my next school didn't even know I had one, ever. Unbelievable. So I knew that. The second thing I knew was that my mom and dad didn't know what would happen in this space. They didn't know. Like, it all seems fine now, in retro, but they didn't know that was going to happen. They had no idea that was going to happen. Imagine the faith that must have taken. Yeah, but son, go on, off you go. <laughs> but imagine the faith that must have taken. They didn't know. It's the last thing you, says, there's no speech pathology textbook that says, you know, chapter five, throw them into some public speaker and let's see what happens. Because <laughs> like, does it, no one does that. And I shudder, I shudder to think that my mom or dad would have picked up the phone and stopped it. Because if she'd have stopped it, I wouldn't have gone up there and I wouldn't have seen what I saw and I wouldn't have felt what I felt and I wouldn't have learned what I learned. And so in some really meaningful ways, I wouldn't be who I am. And, and that's what I learned from, from my grandma Joe, space making. So if I can just leave you, I think, with this one th- thought, that what every single instinct of yours is to grab the joystick on the Pac-Man game and jerk and pull, and even when you say, I'm doing it for love, you're not. L- love is space making. Become a great space maker. So when every instinct says reach in, remember when you take away the space, you take away the choice. When you take away the choice, you take away the learning. When you take away the learning, you take away growth. And also, and I suppose mercy, most important, you take away love. You take away love. Rachel was saying this, you, see your child. You can't love what you can't see. You can't love what you can't see. 
Create the space, see the child. People have said to me that the hardest thing for my son or any of the kids involved in this to deal with is that their mothers or fathers didn't have faith in them. And yeah, that's going to be hard to process. But what's even harder is that deep down, those parents basically said to those children, I don't want to see you. Not for who you really are. I don't want to see you. I don't know how he's going to process that. So please, make space. See the child. See your people. It's a gift that you're giving them. So John, just by way of closing, I want to thank you, first of all. Um, Jack's mom is going to be sentenced on October the 23rd, two weeks from now. I have no idea what to do. I don't know which child to be with. I have no playbook for this. I'm a part of a forest I've never been in, and I'm angry. In case it doesn't come across, I am super angry. Someone has hurt my child. And I said to John, um, how do I forgive someone who hasn't apologized? I've had no apology. And John said, you have to forgive her because the forgiving isn't for her, it's for you. And I, thank you. And then I'm just going to say thank you to you all. I'm a repressed, uptight Brit, and this doesn't come very (laughs) easily for me at all. So thank you for listening. And I hope that there might be some small part of my experience that when you get lost in the forest, you can still find some way to rally those around you, your kids, your followers, to a a brighter future. Thank you very much.